Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad you're with us as we gather together in the presence of our Lord. So what bold move might be God calling you to make? You know, history was made uh, around the world, uh, across human history, when people make bold moves. It would be small moves like uh, intervening or saying what needs to be said or uh, instead of being a, a bystander that just looks in or takes a video but inter- actually enters the moment. Those are bold moves. Martin Luther had a bold move. Martin Luther King Jr. has led the civil rights movement as a bold leader. We've got countless men and women across human history who made bold moves. So the question we're wrestling with is, what, God, what bold move might be God asking you to do this week? Because we're going to look at Gideon. We're going to continue our story uh, and our look at Gideon. And uh, we're dis- we'll discover that God asked Gideon certainly to make a bold move to lead the people of Israel, but his journey this morning we- it becomes an inward journey, and we'll see that as we read uh, Judges this morning. Like I said, we're glad we can be together, or wh- whether we online or here, God has brought us together to worship. So let's do so as we stand and sing our first hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are our fortress and our strength. You send us out as your ambassadors to share your, share your gospel, speak the truth in love, and work for justice and peace in this world. Have your way in us. Form and reform on us for the tasks you call us to engage in. Draw us nearer to you daily so that we may draw our confidence from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Joanna, and I will be reading this morning. The lesson is from Judges chapter 6, cha verses 6, 25 through 32. Verse 25. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord of the, your God on the top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But he was afraid of his family and the townspeople. So he went at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, with the Asherah pole beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, Bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's case? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when he, someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerob Baal, that day saying, let Baal contend with him. This is the word of our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up and to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what 
we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove, out the town, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So the question is, we're, we're asking, I'd ask us to contemplate uh, today, but throughout the week. God, what are you asking me to do that might be bold uh, to step into a moment? And we find that Gideon is asked by, by God to do that. We, so just the last few weeks, we've looked at Gideon's life from his call by God as the Midianites were coming upon the Israel, uh, the, the country of Israel and the Israelites to destroy them. Midian is God, excuse me, Gideon is chosen by God to lead the people of Israel against the Midianites. God says, you are a mighty warrior. Gideon sees himself as a reluctant warrior. I mean a warrior, but he's, he, no, he's pretty reluctant. And this morning we pick up where we left off last week and we find out what God is first and foremost asking Gideon to do. And Gideon is to wrestle on an internal level about going against his family. And uh, that bold move, it's one bold move to lead the people of Israel against the Midianites. I think sometimes it's an even bolder move to self-differentiate yourself against your family. And Gideon does it, but we also find out he's pretty afraid when he does it as well. This is, this is where uh, we find out for ourselves that before we feed 5,000 people like the disciples, that internal warrior has to be right here. There has to be a strength on the inside that Gideon needs to have, that we need to have before we do bold moves. And God challenges Gideon to do this. Well, he commands Gideon to do it, but Gideon is certainly challenged by it. It's interesting uh, that, look, uh, that Gideon is asked to destroy his father's altar to Baal, a foreign god, an idol, and the Asherah pole, which I'm not sure exactly what an Asherah pole is. You can look it up online. I'm sure lots of people have studied what Asherah poles are and what they do. But certainly it's related to the worship of Baal, which is not the God of Israel. And so immediately we find out in Gideon's family there's dysfunction. There is uh, not even alignment in faith. And we don't know if Gideon is living with his father and his mother and maybe his siblings. We don't know that. We don't even know if they live close together. We can, we can assume in those days they probably lived fairly close together. Regardless, uh, I don't think this was an overnight decision by his dad to make an altar to, and an Asherah pool to Baal. This had been going on for a while. And Gideon knows that his family is part of the problem. God knows, Gideon, your family is part of the problem why we're in this situation. And so maybe, that we don't know how long it's been going on, but maybe it's been going on for years and years and years. Or maybe months. But regardless, for a long time, and even before Gideon was commanded by God to do something, Gideon's attitude was, get along to go along. That's my dad, he does his thing 
I do my thing. Have you ever been in that place? Have a family member, I don't want to get involved. You do your thing. You do you, I'll do me. It's better just to get along, to go along. But God says, no, Gideon, I don't want you just to confront your dad. I want you to go there and destroy the altar. I want you to destroy the Asherah pole. Talk about a bold move. And kill some bulls. Build a new altar where the old one was. In the face of his father, an altar then would be to the people of Israel's God, Yahweh. Gideon does so, it says, he does so at night because it says he's afraid of his father and his family. Well, no, duh. I would be too. Look, here's the thing. I, I did nothing that big when I was a kid and growing up with my family. But there, every family has their rules. Unspoken and spoken rules. Here was a spoken rule in my family. It was told to me when I was probably 10 years old. Mike, we root for the Browns. <laughs> I remember my dad saying that. We do not root for the Pittsburgh Steelers. If you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I love you. My wife's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan too. But it was clear to me. There will be no... Rooting for, watching, speaking in favor of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And look, I'm not, it's, I'm not going to go to my room for it. I'm not going to get kicked out of the house for it. But it was a really strong, like, we're not messing around here. This is why I, all these years when the Browns have been so bad, I can't not root for them. Because it was ingrained in me when I was 10. Gideon is no different. You're no different. We all have these unspoken, spoken rules in our families. Things we say, should say, we shouldn't say. Things we should believe, we shouldn't believe. And Gideon is no different. Gideon has to confront his dad about his religious worship. And religious worship is deeply personal. You're touching a nerve. You know, look, what we talk about that. What, what are two subjects you don't talk about? Politics and religion. You know, you don't sit at the Thanksgiving table and talk about religion. Now he's got to destroy this stuff. But Gideon, the reluctant warrior he is, and the growing warrior he is, finds some strength inside himself and he does it. Even though he does it at night. I don't, I don't fault him for that. And even God doesn't fault him for it. He does it. The next day, people find out. People are very, very angry. But you notice his dad's not angry. People want to find out who did it. They tell him that Gideon did it. The crowd comes to Joash, Gideon's dad's house. And Joash, what I, in a bold move, defends his son. Isn't that cool? That Gideon's integrity and Gideon's strength influenced his dad. And certainly his dad loves his son. No question about it. But I think Gideon's strength, his warrior inside himself, caused his dad to defend his son. There's a beauty in that moment there. The journey to become a warrior, to do bold moves, whether it be speaking what needs to be spoken, Listening when no one's listening. Praying when nobody else is praying. If you're the only one. The bold move, whether big or small, comes from the inside. It comes from a strength of character that says, I can differentiate myself from somebody else. And if I'm the only one standing, I'm going to stand. If I'm the only one who's going to say this, I'm going to say it. Because it's the right thing thing to do. Psychologists across uh, the last decades have studied human systems, and they talk about self-differentiation. And there's people who, leaders and, and individuals who have enough internal principle and character about themselves that they can self-differentiate themselves from the crowd. Those with low s sense of self 
and differentiation from himself, generally go along with the crowd. They're afraid of what people will think. They have a low self sense of self. Instead, their self is kind of wrapped up in the gravitational pull, so they call it, the gravitational pull of the emotional system of the crowd around them. Gideon wasn't that guy. Gideon had enough differentiation in himself to not stand by and let something happen, but instead by God's leading to do something about it. Again, sociologists and psychologists talk about the bystander effect. You know about that? But the whole bystander effect is when you see something happen, it, the more people in a room, the more responsibility is diffused about who's going to intervene. It could be anything, small or large. But the bystander uh, that intervenes has enough differentiation of self to say, Some, I have enough principle in myself, I need to do something. Somebody needs to do something. And if that's me, that's the bold move I need to make, right? That's what the bystander who involves him or herself does. And we all need that. We need Christians who, instead of liking things that are unlikable on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and stop, instead of sharing things all the time, put a stop. No. Have enough sense of self, of dignity and character and worth to say that's not right. We shouldn't perpetuate this evil in this world, whatever that is morally. And that's the strength of character that it lived in Gideon and that lives in us as people of God because God has made us who we are. And yet we might feel reluctant, but God is moving us forward. This week I, I heard this story of Ruby, what's her name? Ruby Bridges. You know Ruby Bridges? Ruby Bridges in 1960 was one of four African American girls, age six, who were, uh, whose families were to integrate the schools in Louisiana. In 1960. Ruby, Ruby Bridges uh, gave a TED talk about this, and it's worth going to see her story on, online. And she said that she remembers that day when the first day of school happened. As a six year old kid, she was escorted into the school in Louisiana with federal marshals. There were no other, other kids in the school that day, except for three other African American girls or kids. All the white kids and the families had pulled their kids out of school. The teachers across Louisiana quit because they refused to teach African-American kids integrated in their classrooms. Ruby Bridges spent the entire year in a classroom by herself with one teacher. There was a principal of the school, by the way. And there were some white kids who were still there. He hailed the white kids from Ruby, Ruby Bridges so they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk. The entire year. She said, though, there was one teacher from Boston who, who actually moved from Boston to that town in Louisiana to teach Ruby. And she and Ruby developed a relationship over the years. She said, this very day, this was a couple years ago, we're still good friends. Talk about a bold move of a teacher moving into a very tense situation in Louisiana to teach one kid for an entire year. That's amazing and beautiful. Talk about Ruby having enough strength, and certainly she had to be there. You say, well, she was a kid. Yes, but her family could have pulled her out too. But the right thing to do was the right thing to do, to be in that moment, to, be, to do what's right. Whether it be Ruby Bridges or Gideon or even, lastly, I would say, Kellen. So yesterday, I, was, I spent all day yesterday in uh, the Cincinnati area with um, my son's baseball team. I'm one of his coaches for his baseball team. And so we had a tournament down in Cincinnati, and there was a 
between the games, so we had a double header. Between the games, we had a long time between the two games. And um, we had a break, and so I went to the convenience store to get some water because it was hot. So I, when I was at the convenience store, a car pulled up to next to me. That was guys from our team. And they pile out of the car, and one kid goes, oh, my gosh, coach, Kellen had to call 911. I'm like, what the, what is going on, you know? I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, some dad was beating on his kid. Oh, come on. So I get in my car, I go down, and my son Ethan is with Kellen. And there was a lot, it was a large group of people and four different games going on. And Kellen and Ethan are sitting there. I said, Kellen, what's going on? And Kellen says, oh, yeah. So that game over there, the kid struck out. The coach started screaming at him. Um, the kid says, I quit. There's kind of this moment, this tense moment, awkward moment on the field. That happens. But then it escalated, and we find out that's dad and son, because dad runs over to son, son lunges at his dad, they start arguing, dad gets the kid in a headlock in front of all these people. It shouldn't have happened anyway at home or in public. He grabs him, puts him in a headlock, starts punching his son. Awful. People are watching. But what does 17-year-old Kellen do? I was so proud of Kellen. Kellen says, I didn't know if anybody else called 911. I was calling 911 because that's not right. Because he said, and here's a 17-year-old kid who said, put, put it together. He says, if he's doing that here with all these people, what's he doing at home? Like, Kellen, here's a fist bump for you, brother. Here's a kid and he went over to him, and he talked to the, to the kid. Kellen talked to the people around him. They talked, Kellen talked to the sheriff. And this mature 17-year-old kid who said, I'm not going to watch or take a video of this and put it online and, and shock everybody by this. No, what needs to be done is somebody needs to call the authorities so this stops. That's Kellen's bold move yesterday. We lost both games, but we won that day. Because Kellen intervened. We can all be Kellens. We don't know when that moment's going to arrive. But as God's people who is called by God to be in this world as ambassadors to work for justice and peace in all the world, we do those things. We've done those things. And we continue to do those things on behalf of serving the greater good around us. And what God wants to do in this world whether it be tearing down an altar in our family's home or intervening in a situation like yesterday. Together we do this. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for um, people like Ruby Bridges and Kellen and Gideon and so many others who have inspired us, Lord, to be better, to be stronger, to do as you would have us do in this world to intervene, to not watch, but to be bold and to act. And so we pray that you would give us new eyes and new hearts and new, new ears to hear and see and respond as you ask us to in this world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
We confess our faith, please stand, uh, with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we humble ourselves before God to confess our sins. Gracious Lord God, we confess that we have all sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions by what we have done and by what we have neglected to do. I've done what is evil in your sight. I often trip into repeated patterns of sin. I have wearied myself with sinning and sometimes feel trapped. We cry out to you, O Lord, deliver us for the sake of Jesus, forgive us all our sins. Give us the assurance that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remind us that nothing can separate us from your love. Raise us up to live lives that are pleasing to you. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. The Lord is with you, mighty and reluctant warrior. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all your sins have been forgiven. You are now free to love God and live in obedience to his commandments. Amen. up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who overcame on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending. Our Lord was betrayed. He, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray as the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And please come. The feast is prepared. If you'd like to come forward for bread and, and the wine, please come forward. Uh, if you'd like to use the small cups, the disposable ones, and not come forward, that's fine. They're in the back if you've not picked one up already. Please come. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church around the world that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Free people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Bless all who suffer today. Evelyn Baer, Scott Baer, Teresa Borgesi, Jean Donahy, Bruce Ebert, Tina Fox, Eric and Jackie Harmon, David Hutchison, David Kane, Whaley Lee, Pam Madden, Sharon Neparatz, Earl Osborne, Ken Pate, Margie Rachel, Autumn Regula and family, Doug Rose, KB Sharp, Don Spencer, Amy Themens, Ben and Ulysses Truitt, Ricky and Roy Van Sickle, Chad Winterhoff, Dennis and Sue Winterstein, Tracy Wood, and Eric Waddell. We pray for those who grieve, the family and friends of Phyllis Bratt, the family and friends of Scott Mallory, the family and friends of Brianna Pangborn, the family and friends of Terry Hosfeldt. We give thanks, O Lord, for the birth of Claire Elizabeth Snyder to Dane and Elizabeth Snyder, and the birth of Reese Howard to Lily and Mark Howard. And Lord, we cry out as many have cried out in the West for an end to the extreme drought in the West. Bring rain, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Sovereign God, this house of worship belongs to you. We give thanks and pray for our church musicians, especially Jenny Chrysler, Aaron McCullough, and the worship team, and those who sing in the choir and the bells. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the cries of children, the melody of voice and instruments, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Please be seated. All right. So, uh, in your bulletin, it says graduate recognition. The later this morning, we are going to recognize our graduates uh, from our congregation who graduated from high school. Uh, so, we're grateful for that. We'll do that later this morning. Just a couple announcements. Uh, if you have a chance to fill, up, fill out the connection card, please, please do so. Uh, there's opportunities, ways for you to volunteer this week uh, on the back of that card. We have a blood drive coming up tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, you can reserve your time to give blood at redcrossblood.org. Uh, baseball night tickets are now available, as you, we mentioned last week if you were here or if you heard. We're having two baseball nights for St. Luke at the Clippers game, thanks to Steve Howard. And uh, that's June 25th and August 8th. Uh, cost is $8.50 per ticket. Uh, Steve will be here after, the, after worship, so if you want to uh, talk to him about tickets, please do so uh, after worship. Uh, the pandemic for Sunday morning depleted our volunteer teams, and there are a number of rewarding ways for you to help out on Sunday mornings, whether it be ushering, the sound system, sermon slides, live stream, and the altar guild. Uh, any of those positions, training is provided so you can sign up on the back of the connection card or online to, or call the church office if you want to be part of that. And uh, we are grateful, as I mentioned in the prayers, two births, uh, the, um, the Snyders, but also uh, the Howards, our new grandparents again, as of the 3.30, 3.15 this morning, 3.13 this morning. What an early morning. God, that's great. Make sure you uh, congratulate them, and, and as you see, Lily and Mark uh, as well. We'll congratulate them. Everybody says everybody's doing fine. It's great. Good. All right, we're grateful. And um, those are the announcements for this morning. Are we good? Are we good? All right, please stand as we receive the Lord's blessing. My friends, live with the sure and certain knowledge that in the death and resurrection of Jesus, all evil has been defeated, and you belong to the eternal kingdom of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, go on in peace and live to please the Lord. Thanks be to you.